Welcome to the Genealogy Radio Show, the radio show that's keeping you in the loop. And this week's show is all about part two of the Crosbys of Cork, Kerry, Leash and Leinster. Bards, imposters, landlords, politicians, aeronauts and newspapers by Michael Christopher Keane. We had a fascinating show last week and we're looking forward to hearing more, Michael. Thank you for coming back to us. Thank you indeed, Lorna. Nice to hear from you again. Michael, I want to move on to the Crosbys of Carlo Wicklow, a victim of the 1798 rebellion, a pioneer of Irish aviation. All those kind of topics. Tell us a little bit about the second half of the book. Yeah, Lorna, well, um, just to revert very briefly to the earlier part of it, um, the Crosbys became the big landlords of North Kerry, as, as we said in the previous uh, show. And um, what happened was that some of them uh, were able to go back to their original homeland in Leash, and they had Crosby Castle there, but that, that eventually they lost that because they took the wrong side during the Cromwellian period. But they re-established themselves in County Wicklow as um, landlords there. And um, a couple of generations later, two members of the family, uh, two brothers, um, Edward and um, Robert, um, had extraordinary <laughs> diverse um, uh, end results. Um, uh, the older brother, Sir Edward, he, they, they, they were Sir, uh, Sirs at the time, Sir Edward um, of Wicklow, um, actually moved the County Carlow to a big estate there on Browns Hill, just outside Carlow town. And this was just around the time of the 1798 rebellion and the, the, the preliminaries to that with Wolf Tone and so on. Now, he was a very mild gentleman and he didn't really take any side in it, apparently. But uh, a lot of his staff there, the steward and the butler and so on, were very much in the leadership of the um, 1798 rebellion locally in Carlow. And um, he probably just turned a blind eye to them. And it was claimed that maybe afterwards that he was secretly offering them some support, that he was more on their side than on, we'll say, the, 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 the English ascendancy side. And um, they staged a, a big um, uh, attack on Carlow town, on the English um, establishment there. Uh, but of course, they had spies, and the spies had um, informed um, the, the English um, military in the town who were ready for them. And there was a, a massive slaughter when they, 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 they marched into the town, um, uh, including one of the places they marched from was the, um, uh, Sir Edward Crosby's estate. Uh, and so uh, some claims say that there's as many as 600 were killed in the slaughter, some innocent people and some of them, those who were party of the rebellion. And there was a mass burial in the little village um, outside um, uh, Carlo town called Great Cullen. I actually happen to have a sister-in-law living there, Lorna, so I know it very well. And there's a big monument there to the 1798 rebellion. And um, what happened then was that the English side um, uh, accused Sir Edward Crosby of being um, a party to it and um, offering his support. And they captured him from his big house and uh, took him and had a really what was a mock trial and um, had him, uh, uh, had him um, executed and put his head in a pike outside Carlo Jail up in the wall as tended to happen at that time to make sure nobody else did the same thing. So that was the sad end of Sir Edward Crosby. Meantime, his brother um, had become uh, a student in Trinity, not a very good student. He was quite rebellious. Um, but um, he um, had a great interest in engineering and uh, um, uh, the flying by balloon, the very start of that was happening at the time. And uh, he got very much into that and he became Ireland's first aeronaut actually. Uh, with enormous publicity. He was great for publicity, and he lifted off from um, Ranella in Dublin uh, with an enormous turnout of people to great acclaim. And so he achieved fame in his own way as Ireland's um, first uh, aeronaut in his balloon. Now, he travelled right across Dublin City and um, uh, landed um, eventually and um, became a great celebrity in Dublin. Uh, now, he, he kept 
doing this, and he had a big ambition to get go across the Irish Sea, but he never quite achieved it. He got a long way over in, in one flight, um, but he never actually achieved it in the end. Uh, and so um, he achieved great fame in his own way. Now, what, he, what date was this, Michael? Just around what date? Oh, it was in um, the 1780s. Oh, wasn't he really ahead of his time when you think about it? Yeah. And uh, now he was supposed to have disappeared from public view completely and became um, uh, unknown because um, everybody, people realised that they didn't have to pay money to go and watch the balloon taking off because it was up in the sky and they could see it from anywhere. So it became more and more difficult to raise money. In fact, his last flight, Lorna, in Ireland was from Limerick and he went all over Clare and Kerry, back over Crosby's own home country in Kerry. And he landed um, near Bunratty, I think it was. Uh, as a, and that, this was a big event in, in, a, in the part of the country that you and I come from. Uh, but that was his last flight in Ireland. And then he disappeared from public view when people thought he was impoverished and, and it was uh, believed he was dead. But in fact, he had, he had gone on another flight. He'd gone to America because he was in great debt. <laughs> and um, he reestablished himself over there as a, as a well-known actor. And um, he also got involved with um, the early aeronaut aeronautical activities in America. And... 15 or 20 years later, he was rediscovered by his friends here in Ireland that he was actually alive. And they brought him home and um, he became a bit of a celebrity all over again in a few years before he died. So he had a happy ending after all. Uh, oh, that's fantastic. It was an extraordinary life. And thanks, for uh, telling, and thanks for telling us that story. And we have the Crosby's uh, of Kerry in the early 1800s. So we've got key developments in Irish alcohol agriculture in the early 19th century that's a fascinating part and i'm going to be enjoying uh, this is a wonderful book absolutely great book guys if you're, you're looking for this type of way of putting a, a family history together yeah it's about agriculture yeah there's about 500 years of crosby's um some of them were not good farmers at all i would say they had very good land um some of the best tillage land uh, well the best tillage land in kerry which mightn't be too difficult but uh, among the best in ireland really in their third valley high abidorney causeway that kind of country in north kerry um and uh, one of them developed a prize short turn herd um in the 1800s he was william they had become double barrel names at that time due to marriage. They were Talbot Crosby's. He was William Talbot Crosby. Uh, he developed a prize short horn herd, and some of the, um, uh, the, the breed were distributed all over Ireland. And indeed, some of them even went outside Ireland. They became so well known. And so he was very good on the agricultural side, but he became notorious as a landlord in other respects because um, he was big into evictions. And of course, this was a, he, he lived for 60 years as, as landlord uh, up to the end of the 1800s. And uh, this was the time of the Great Famine, of course, and its aftermath. And uh, it, it hit his part of the country, that Northwest Kerry parishes, it hit them very hard. They had one of the biggest population declines of anywhere in Ireland at the time. And he uh, had a reputation and a fairly notorious reputation for uh, levelling um, uh, poor cottiers' uh, houses and that to, to, to do what he wanted to do with his farm and his estate. And um, he is known to the present day down there um, as Billy the Leveller. William Talbot Crosby would be known locally as Billy the Leveller because of all the houses that he levelled. Uh, some reports said he would have... Um, destroyed maybe 600 homes at the time. Others now uh, would dispute that and say that figure is an exaggeration, but certainly quite a lot. I mean, that's one of the horrifying things about this, just pre-famine and during the famine and stuff. And one, of, I think one of the most horrible things I ever came across was the fact that they had these, you know, loans and everything, the reproductive loan fund, but they came looking for the money in the 1860s. They looked for that money back even though people were decimated the debt didn't die with the person who took it out that's right so that's right. it was incredibly yeah. difficult to stay solvent 
Mm-hmm. And that's why an awful lot of people emigrated when the second depression occurred in the 1880s, early 1882, because they just couldn't face it again. They wouldn't have been able to manage. And America was a really good option and provided a wonderful way to resource and to be able to become upwardly mobile very, very quickly. It's something I stress to people that I look after in, in their family histories that it would be unheard of to be able to make a fortune within your own lifetime in an Irish setting from being a cottier or a labourer. Just unheard of. It's so we have the learning. Great Famine and the Crosbys and, and so on. So a very sad time and that. And what happens with them between the Great Famine and World War I? Yeah, um, no, this, this, this man with a very bad reputation, William Talbot Cosby, he was a bit of an aberration, really, among the Cosbys. Generally speaking, they would have had a pretty good reputation as landlords. Firstly, they were always resident landlords with two big mansions, Artford House or Artford Abbey, as it was known, and Ballyhigh Castle. Uh, and um, just to go, take one step backwards, Lorna, um, during the uh, period of Daniel O'Connell now. Daniel O'Connell before Catholic emancipation, when he couldn't be represented in the British House of Parliament, he was a supporter of the Crosbys and they backed him as well. So they were on the side of Catholic emancipation way back, uh, uh, which would have helped their popularity, I suppose, locally. And um, although admittedly, when it came to the Act of Union in 1801, uh, their two mansions were in poor repair and uh, they were very quick uh, to take the big bribes that were going so as to vote for the Act of Union. They were in both the House of Lords at the time. One of them was the Earl of Glendore, was his title in the, in the Irish House of Lords. And the other one, James from Ballyhigh Castle then, uh, had first, he was in the Irish House of Commons. And... Um, both of them um, went to Westminster, one in, in the British House of Lords and the other one in the British House of Commons for many years afterwards. James was there until 1826. Um, so they had a good reputation through that period supporting Catholic emancipation. The, 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 the man with the poor reputation, then William, came along and was there for about 60 years. But extraordinary, to get back to your question, um, Lorna, his successor, Lindsay Talbot Crosby, was again a very popular man. And he, um, in fact, instigated through letters in the Times of London and the newspapers in Dublin, the whole uh, movement towards the tenants being able to buy their properties through the Winter Act. And he is often seen as the first man to get that whole ball rolling and is credited as such with it. He had been in Scotland for a number of years and he saw all the crofters' rebellions there and it obviously affected him and he saw that tenants uh, couldn't be left as they were. So he, he was the opposite to, to William. And um, extraordinarily then, his son again coming after him, um, Morris Talbot Crosby, um, as, along with the Linz, Lindsay Talbot Crosby, they were great supporters of, um, of John Redmond and Home Rule. We're into the 1900s now. And, um, and Morris Talbot Cosby actually ran for the Irish Parliamentary Party in the 1918 general election. So there were certainly home rulers, not Sinn Féiners now, they were still landlords and that, I suppose, but they were certainly home rulers and uh, supporters of the Irish Parliamentary Party. Now, he ran in County Cork, where he, he wasn't the inheriting son, uh, where he had come to be a businessman. And... Um, that that was um, that was uh, what what happened there. Now, unfortunately, the War of Independence, of course, broke out after Sinn Féin's great success in the 1918 general election, and then the Civil War. And as part of that, both of their big mansions were burned down in Kerry. Um, one of them, um, Ballyhigh Castle, had been housing. Um, uh, black and tans periodically, so it became a prime target and uh, met, a, met a bad end. And um, Arthur Abbey then was destroyed during the Civil War uh, um, when it, the, 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 the um, Free State forces were um, thought that they, 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 were, they were maybe going to occupy it and um, the other side um, couldn't allow that to happen, so they destroyed it. it that has disappeared. There's no trace of it there anymore. But Ballyhigh Castle, uh, a lovely seaside resort, of course, 
is partially restored and very prominent if anybody is, is in Ballyhigh. It's partially restored and is now really the site of the Ballyhigh Golf Club. So that's the Crosbys of Kerry. They disappeared into private life then. Um, I had a bit of contact with one of them, Lorna, um, who's a very nice man. And he actually supplied me with images of the portraits of the family through the generations, which I have included in the book. So I'm very grateful to Donald for that. Oh, thank you. And the, the Cork Examiner from the 1840s to the 1920s, how did they get involved in, in, in the newspaper? Well, um, what happened there um, is that a young Thomas Crosby, uh, I know this is more your territory, Lorna, I haven't really been able to fully establish the precise details of his family tree, but he left Artford in North Kerry uh, in the early 1840s uh, to join the Cork Examiner in Cork as a reporter. Uh, so he's certainly a Crosby from the home of the Crosbys in North Kerry. Uh, and um, I, I've been trying to um, look at um, baptisms and that to pinpoint his date. Oh, we'll have to try and do a bit of deciphering for no, that Lorna, for you now. I, 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 I'll be looking for yourself now to help with this. Yeah, absolutely. So anyway, he, he just joined as a very young reporter and um, a great man, Maguire, had established the Cork Examiner in 1841, another great supporter of Daniel O'Connell. And he became an MP and was more and more involved with politics in Westminster. And the young Thomas Crosby was very, very talented. And lo and behold, he went up the ladder and eventually came to own the whole newspaper. And so five generations of Crosbys owned the Examiner, which brings us almost right up to the present day. They finally sold the, the, their last holding in it to the Irish Times, um, who took it over in 2017. And of course, they were very much part of the establishment in Cork and Munster, particularly reporting on all the big events, um, 1916, the War of Independence, the Civil War, and so on. And um, politics was in the blood all the time because a couple of the, the Cork Examiner Crosbys were elected to the to Shannon Aaron in, in the 1930s and 1940s as well. And they, they were very much part of the cultural and commercial life of Cork. Very well-known family indeed. Oh, that's fantastic. And it's a, it's a really wonderful book. And I just want to tell our listeners, because we're winding up now for, for our second part of The Crosbys of Cork, Kerry, Leash and Leinster. Um, this book is on sale where, Michael? How can people buy it? Is it through online? Can they buy it or where? Um, it's on sale in local bookshops in Cork and Kerry, but that's not great for a lot of people. Yeah. It will be online, Lorna. It's just been launched. Um, I expect that um, O'Mahony's of Limerick and Kinney's of Galway will have it online. Hannah's in Dublin will have it online um, as well. Um, but I, Fantastic. I, I'm, just, I'm just making the context there with, with, with all of them at the moment. But they can get it from... Through, with my email address, um, I don't know if, if, if you can offer a service. Lord. I can. I can put it on my interested. website. I've got my. I've got a new website that's going to be launched in uh, September, which will be Lorna Maloney, uh, so on. So I'll have my own name on it, and and uh, I'll put a page on it where they can contact you, Michael, and order the book as well. That's great, Lorna. Thank you very much. Because that's something that I like to do, and I like to support. Um, our, our way of genealogical expertise and wonderful family histories like this, which are the mainstay of good genealogical practice and not just the generalized stuff that we, 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 we get, but isn't as informative as what a genealogical study can be. Michael, I want to thank you for your time for the two shows. I really appreciate it. It's really good that people can buy this wonderful book. And uh, are you going to have a public launch now that we're finished, kind of finishing a small bit of lockdown and so on? I'm still treading carefully, Lauren. <laughs> yes, I am too. Even I know. Though I'm fully vaccinated. I'm I'm into my 70s at this stage, Lauren. Yes, we're all the same. I'm treading a bit gingerly. We're all so treading I, I, gingerly too. And, yeah, and, I don't, yeah, I don't absolutely. Have, I don't have plans just yet for a public launch, Lauren. Well, we might have a we might have an online launch, Michael. That that sounds like a very good idea, Lauren. And I'd like to arrange that for idea. you. And we can have a Zoom online launch and do a couple of talks and so on, which would be wonderful, I think. 
That sounds like a great idea, Lorna. Maybe that's... And we might do that in October. That would be a lovely going into the winter. And I certainly would have um, some ideas for that. That sounds wonderful, Lorna. I look forward to pursuing that for... I've, excellent. Because if we can't have a face-to-face -face launch, we're definitely going to do this online. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank our listenership, which has stayed very constant and we haven't missed one show during the pandemic. Uh, I'm updating the... The list of shows so i know a lot of you always ask me for an index and all that and i've got it up to about two or three years ago we're going into our seventh season or sorry our 14th or 15th season of the genealogy radio show on the seventh year and we're looking specially at place and space for the next six or seven months and wonderful launches like this and book reviews as well so we've got a lot of exciting shows ready for you michael thank you very very much for your time today and thank you indeed lorna as well <laughs>